Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Authors at Google Talk. Uh, though I suppose for a few more weeks, Gary's not technically an author. Um, his book is long overdue about wine. He's really one of the freshest voices in the wine industry, giving really candid and energetic reviews um, every day on winelibrary.tv, his podcast. He's also made a bit of a name for himself in the tech world lately, and we're really stoked to have him here at Google. So please join me in welcoming Gary Vaynerchuk. So first, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me. I am thrilled to be here. Brittany, I gotta give you a huge shout out for getting me to be here. So, super thrilled, uh, awfully pumped to drink some wine today um, and talk about really anything you want. I, I tend to, when I do talks with tech companies, since this is a tech company, um, a lot of the questions and things that people want to talk about is social media and how I built my brand and why, why do so many people follow you on Twitter and all that stuff. So I'm, I'm thrilled to do that. I'm really interested in doing this very Q&A with you guys. I don't really want to stand up here and brag about how awesomely rad I am, though I'm thrilled to do it if you let me, so be careful. Um, But what I really want to do is, obviously, I want to talk about the wines. We have three wines. I want to do that. Uh, And I do want to talk about, you know, technology and how I've been able to do some things with a very stagnant wine industry and create some buzz. I'm going to play one little thing. Every time I do these things, everybody plays the Conan O'Brien piece, which is awesome, but... He's so much taller than me, I don't really like, really like watching it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to play the Nightline piece, which ran. This, for anybody, probably most of you who don't know who I am, will give you some sort of feel. So this was awesome, except Nightline that I was speaking at Futures of Web City Apps in London when I decided to air this, so I had no time to you know buzz it out, so nobody saw Sancerre it. And Sauvignon Blanc, except for the people that actually watch Nightline. Bouquet or the woody tones of an oak-fermented Chardonnay. As more and more people enjoy drinking wine, there's also the challenge of how to describe it. I like loud. So now, one too wine loud? aficionado has dispensed with the hefty vocabulary because he believes that anyone That's can it. evaluate a good vintage. Here's ABC's Ryan Owens. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wine Library TV. I am your host, Gary Vay, Ner, Chuck. If this. Wayne's World had a wine aficionado, he'd be it. Ah, the Oak Monster. This 31-year-old rabid football fan, notice the New York Jets bucket, is on a one-man mission to uncork the mysteries of wine. We're changing the wine world, aren't we? And it's somewhere low, it's 15% alcohol content. From the office of his wine shop in, of all places, New Jersey, Gary records a webcast five days a week. He says each averages close to 40,000 viewers. This is a a kick in the nards. I'm going to trick you, sucker, kind of wine. Look at this color. This is like eating your shoe. I mean, this is a lot of leather. You know, like the golden locks. And the entire rainbow of flavor exploded into our face. The American dream. Woo! And some of the rainbow even got up our nose. And that's what's going on with this wine. He sucks rocks, (laughs) eats dirt, anything to explain what you should look for in a bottle. When I describe wine, I describe it how it truly tastes to me. Capronk never, ever failed to deliver bell peppers. And a lot of people want to use the wine terms, cassis and terroir and all these terms. And if it tastes like big league chew to me, then that's what it's going to (laughs) be. It has absolutely attacked my palate. Gary's style is brash, but don't be fooled. He knows his stuff. His parents immigrated from Russia and opened a modest liquor store here in 1983. Gary worked in the family business from the beginning and got hooked. He started reading Wine Spectator magazine in junior high. By high school, he was giving shoppers advice on Cabernets and Chardonnays. This is the old store. Before long, Gary turned his parents' small store into the three-story wine library, which now rings up $60 million a year. Americans bought $27 billion worth of wine last year. That's almost twice what they drank a decade ago. And this immigrant son has found a way to capitalize on that. Half his sales are internet-based, wine boxed up and shipped around the country. The first thing when he starts talking to me about the internet and all this (laughs) stuff, I said, it's, you know, the ever dream. So today, we are bringing the thunder. His style has gotten plenty of attention, including from critics, or wine snobs as Gary calls them. They point out he reviews wines he sells, which makes him a good salesman, not a true critic. For you, is this really about wine or is this business? This is not about wine or business. This is about life. 
This is about people realizing we shouldn't be sheep. Hollywood told us to drink Pinot Noir and now everybody drinks Pinot Noir. He's talking about the 2004 film Sideways, which maligned Merlot. And if they want to drink Merlot, we're drinking Merlot. Oh, no, if anybody orders Merlot, I'm leaving. I am not drinking any f***ing Merlot. And since sales of Pinot Noir through the roof. Gary says Sideways is the perfect example of just how intimidated we've become by all those bottles of smashed grapes. Justin's bringing sexy back and I'm bringing Merlot back. <laughs> Gary says when picking a red or a white, forget what you've heard and try everything at every price. To prove the point, he set up a taste test with two bottles. Right one now, retails for $18, the other for 60 Twice so that in most restaurants. Gary said the cheaper was better, and this untrained palate agrees. I would certainly say it tastes better. I do, I do, I did like the smell of that one better, but I don't always smell my wine. Yeah, I mean, if you want to pop a wine and smell it all night, then maybe this is the way to go. But if you do want to consume it, I, I just think this is a great example of where price has no impact on the wine industry. One more lesson, Gary says when you're at a fancy restaurant and the server pours you a taste, quit trying so hard. And so basically the move is... Cool date move, okay. All right. Smell it, you don't even have to taste it. No, because I've never seen anybody deliver the salmon and cut it and analyze it and flip it over oh, and be good. like, oh, it's pink, tremendous. What about the fumbling around <laughs> with the cork? Are there things at the table that you should be looking for in your cork? Is that worth doing? You know, I'm high on doing the Chinese football, a kind of like fling. <laughs> that uh, goes but, over well at the fancy yeah, places. especially when you hit the person. <laughs> yes, Gary well. says he still Great. has a lot to teach and I'm won't sure be satisfied that's until that's wine something. is, that's something I'm well, probably could see. the new beer. I know, you know, my hopes are that the next generation of wine drinkers are a lot more open-minded. You know, I love when somebody emailed me and said, that was one of the best wines I've ever had. I never heard of Chenin Blanc before. I loved it. P.S. I drank it at the NASCAR event this weekend. Yes! That's now what we're making about. progress. Now we're making progress. I'm Ryan Owens for Nightline in Springfield, New Jersey. Wine at the racetrack. That really is progress. Our thanks <laughs> to Rowan, uh, uh, Ryan Owens. And if you'd like to... That was my favorite part. So, <clears throat> basically... I built my family business, I turned 30, and I was dry, I live in Manhattan, I was driving to the store and I freaked out. And I was like, I hate what I do, and screw Zay Frank, I can do that shit. So I decided to video blog. And that's basically how it went down, especially when Lazy Sunday went viral. That's when I was like, okay, people are really starting to watch video, and that's what I wanted to do. And so I really wanted to fix wine. Wine is really fundamentally broken in this country. Nobody has wine self-esteem whatsoever. Everybody thinks they need to know so many things they don't and nobody embraces their own palates. And all I'm trying to do with this media and using new technology is to build a culture where people feel very comfortable trying different things, like the first wine we're having. How many people here have had Chenin Blanc before? Raise your hand. Solid number, it's always good to be on the West Coast. How many people have had Indian Chenin Blanc before? That's good work, nice, solid. But the fact of the matter is a lot of people haven't. And so that's the first wine we're starting with. And so to me it's almost irrelevant whether you like the wine or not. I, a lot of people ask me, Gary, you need to code some sort of schematic and we need to do something so that I know what to order when I'm at a supermarket or on the wine list. And I'm always like, they're like, what should I do? Like I, I answer all my fan email, which is you know, 500 to 1,000 a day. On the flight here this morning, I was very thrilled because the air lasted a lot longer this time for some unknown reason. You can't change the battery, so I'm, I might have to ditch it um, for my European trips. But you know, I got through seven, eight hundred emails. It's what I do. I mean, people email me and say, "What should I have for dinner?" or, or for my anniversary, things of that nature. I'm very in tune and I want to touch my fans. And the biggest question people ask is, "Can you make it easier for me when I go on a date or when I'm going to the supermarket?" And my number one rule: if you leave with anything today is if you do want to explore wine, promise me that you'll always pick something different. And that doesn't mean you're into Pinot Noir and you're buying a different producer. That means you're trying grapes that you've never had before. Because you need to expand your palate. How do you know if your favorite food on earth is our White Castle sliders if you've never had them? And that's the fundamental thing that's going on in the wine industry right now. It's really screwed up because you're listening to Robert Parker or Wine Spectator and that's kind of it. And or you're buying Yellowtail. How many people here drink Yellowtail often? Raise your hand. Right. Nobody wants to admit it. It's awesome. I love it. 
But the fact of the matter is you're buying supermarket brands or whatever's at Costco or whatever easy and that's great. I mean listen, I'm really not here to tell you wine's so awesome or anything of that nature. I think it's phenomenal because fundamentally once you have Johnny Walker Blue, I love scotch. But once you have Laphroaig, you've had Laphroaig. Every wine changes every year and it changes as you, you drink it. The two red wines we have today, especially the Catherine Kennedy Lateral, which we'll have in a little bit, over the next six years, uh, if we taste it on May 17th of every year, the wine would fundamentally be dramatically different. That's pretty rad. You know, and I think that's what gets people into wine. Um, I, I definitely want to go through this first wine. We're going to taste it together. I really, really want it, it to be a Q&A session throughout, whether it's about you know, wine or more about you know, the social media things that we, we've done. So, but the first wine, Let's, uh, let's all grab the first wine. I know you've probably had already, but let's, let's get into it. One of the fundamental things that is being completely missed by the entire world, not just the US market, is smelling the wine. The bouquet is a humongous factor in the overall process of how you're gonna like a wine. So, you know, I really, really, really want you to give this a sniffy sniff, all right? Anybody want to be uh, courageous and throw out some terminology that they're picking up on the nose? It smells like a Chardonnay. It smells like a Chardonnay, okay. And that makes you think what? Oaky? Buttery? Not so much buttery. Has anybody ever had star fruit? Anybody, f- you smell that a little? It's got a really interesting star, see, the Conan clip, if you've ever seen, we ate things, like you saw in that clip a little bit. And when I was 17, I desperately wanted to become a master of wine. I was like, I'm gonna kick everybody's faces in. I'm gonna be the master of wine on earth. I'm gonna Yoda this shit, right? I was like so focused. And, but my parents were really good, like really like good about things. They're like, you're not drinking. I was like, shit, like this is the family, right? And so, no. So, I went backwards, I read The Spectator and I read Parker and every single thing that I saw in the tasting notes, I went out and tasted. I'm like, what's cassis? You know, and, and black raspberries and all this jazz and dirt and grass and all this wild stuff and I felt like that would train my palate so when I'd actually taste them and that really helped me. I, I really do believe that is a competitive advantage I had because in the early years when I was 23, 24, 25, and in a very stoogy, serious, douchebaggy wine industry, I had to really prove myself and the only way I was gonna do that was to win blind tastings. And I did that and I built a bigger wine store than everybody so that worked too. But the fact of the matter is, is that that was hard to break into. You know, I, this is why I love Web 2.0 or, or so, this whole web movement because it's nice. Being 21 and looking 14 in the wine industry in 19, you know, 95 is, it sucks. So, um, so star fruit comes through quite a bit for me. It's kind of light, I mean, you know, it's, it's not aromatically crazy. How about on the palate? How many people like this wine? Raise your hand. How many people hate this wine? How many people are meh? So, I think it's a pretty good sign. Like, I'm kind of meh on it. It's okay. You know, it's it's easy quaffing, porch wine, kind of fun, right? Simple summertime. One big thing I can tell you, if you want to get into wine, you want to learn some subtleties about wine. Stop drinking white wine cold. That is something everybody does. I'm in a. By the way, what I'm telling you right now is in a high minority. Like a lot of people are very out of all the things I'm doing, the insane things I'm doing in the wine industry. The one thing that most people hate is that I'm telling people to drink white wine warm because nobody bl- agrees with me. Fundamentally for me though, my whole career was tasting wine, evaluating to buy it and when you have a white wine that's warm, you can taste it. You know, I call it the high school beer theory, right? The first time you had to drink a beer, you wanted that stuff cold as you could get it because you hated the way it tasted. That's how you hide flavor. So that's a, a big factor. Um, yes? I, I feel that the flavors are exactly the same. I just feel I can taste them when they're warm, right? I mean, you can actually taste like, you know, like this wine actually has a little, does anybody get a little hint of banana peel on this wine? Like, the, you know, do you know what I'm talking about? The inner part? You know, like it's kind of bitter in a way too. Like, have you ever tasted that? Come on, Joel. You've never had the inside of a banana? You're scared of the inside of the banana. My biggest thing that I'm probably proud of through the 440 episodes of Wine Library TV that I've kicked out is that people are starting to talk about wine that's personal to them. 
I had a wine very recently that smelled exactly like Brian Chen's living room in 1984. The likelihood of you being in Brian Chen's living room playing Sega Master System, just have to bring that part up, in 19, or it was 85 actually, 85 is zero, but it smelled like his house. You know how like every house has its own smell? That needs to become a much bigger part of the culture of wine in this country. It can't be what you read. It has to be what you actually smell and taste. How many people here consider themselves wine drinkers? Just curious. I guess that'd be a good reason. How many people really desperately want to get into wine because they think fundamentally on paper it's cool, the way they like it, but they just don't like the way it tastes? <laughs> it's hiding. Um, uh, how many people are drinking Pinot Noir right now? Honestly, it's okay. It's a great grape. I love it. And now, can you keep, can you keep your hand real high? Just real quick. And honestly, how, lower your hand if you didn't really drink it before sideways. Oh, you guys were all street cred like that. You were all on it, right? <laughs> love this. Love it. Um, it's a trend market. And I'm trying to break that because there's a lot of great farmers, and you're gonna get, you guys are gonna get this. You're, you're gonna really get this. There's a lot of great farmers right now who are changing their wine formula to get a good score from Robert Parker. They're they're not letting the terroir speak for itself. And you know, it's funny as our culture in this country gets more green and truthful and nice and right, all this stuff. The wine industry is actually going completely uh, the other way. It's becoming much more commercial. People are looking to make more extracted wines. Wines are being made in the chemistry room, not in the land, and that's a problem, and that's something I really want to try to reverse and get people comfortable in liking what they like. The fact of the matter is the wine self-esteem in this country is zilcho. People are sheep, they, you know, they, they follow other people. I mean, I'm at, I'm at some restaurants and I can actually physically see people sweating as they're picking the wine on the list, and I'm like, this is obnoxious. I mean, it's, it's gotten that bad. Um, and you know, I really, really, really desperately want to change that because wine's been good for my immigrant family and so I feel like I owe it. Um, does anybody have, at this point, some wine questions? Yeah. yeah uh, are you getting uh, pressure? Are you, um, let's see. So I, I, you're, you're trying to change the way you know, wine drinkers view wine, but I wonder now that you're getting popular, you're getting pressure from you know, wine makers as well sure. to you know, promote their wines. Like, can you please just talk about you know, my wine and, and say sure. some good things? Sure, sure. Um, while we're doing this, let's finish this and we'll get to the next wine. The second wine I want you to drink is the Merlot. It's one with the white label and we can just pass it on down. So before I ever started Wine Library, so the big thing that people made fun of me or called me out on early on when I started Wine Library TV is that I was a salesman that I own this store and I have this show and I'm gonna tell you that I like the stuff I have a lot of and you know, I guess, right? And so I was very concerned about church and state early on. But before I ever started Wine Library TV, I, we were one of the biggest independent wine retailers in the country. There's enormous amount of, I don't call pressure, I'm completely on every winery spam PR list you know, and I get hundreds of samples sent to me every day but that was happening before too because we're one of these enormous buyers. Where, what, what's been tough is I built my business on positivity. For example, some of you might know that I declare today Good People Day <laughs> on Twitter. It's getting big, I'm just saying. Um, so I built my business on positivity. So I had nothing but phenomenal kick-ass, you're our son, Gary, relationships, and now some of those wines have been on Wine Library TV and I've told people to flush it down their toilet and that's hurt our relationship as you can probably imagine. <laughs> so that's been weird, that's been very tough for me. I don't have the DNA to be a critic, actually. I hate being disliked. Like, nothing makes me more sad than making front page dig. Because I have to read the comments and they're all very difficult to read. You know, so, like, it's, it's really not in my DNA to do what I do, but for some, I don't know, you know, I love it because I get hundreds to thousands of emails a day from people that tell me things like, thank you so much for doing this show. My dad and I are now friends because we have a, you know, something in common. Like that's the kind of shit that's like, oh my God, you know, that's like, you know, I'm like, who cares about anything? That's like, I want to save that. Like that, that's legacy over currency, which is something I believe in very, very heavily. So um, I definitely think I'm onto something. You know, 87,000 people watched yesterday's episode. That's a lot of people for, a, you guys are, 
familiar with the scene. It's a non-tech show. It's 25 minutes long. And uh, so it's exciting. More wine questions or tech questions or anything? Anybody? Yes. Uh, you were talking that uh, you don't like the commercialization of wine. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the processes uh, you don't like, like the ingredients or what it is that you don't like in commercial wine. Everybody's trying to extract the grapes. They're, you're putting egg whites. They're trying to make the wine as high in alcohol and as big as possible. Even the Pinot Noir that we're drinking today in the market tastes and looks nothing. And I know you've been drinking, I could, right? Looks nothing like the Pinot Noir that was out five years ago. The Pinot Noir that I grew up knowing and loving, you could see your fingers through the glass. That's Pinot. It's a light grape. The Pinot Noir we have now you know, looks like it wants to punch you in your face. It's like so black and bold and it's, it's, it's a completely different animal. And it's really made for you know, a couple of critics that have obnoxious, not a little bit, obnoxious market power. I mean, we have clients who spent seven figures by themselves on 2005 Bordeaux this year, right? Why? Well, because Parker said it's one of the best vintages in the last 100 years. That's it. That's the only reason. There's no other reason. Wine's not even out yet. We put all that money in CDs. It's been really good. You know, I mean, I mean you know, it's, it's an amazingly interesting market. And, you know, for me, I feel like we're starting to make progress with the show only now because my own fans, the Vaniacs, they call me out now. They're like, you're an idiot, I hate that. And I'm like, great, thank you. You know what I mean? So, um, it's pretty interesting. Anybody have anything else? So, oh, I really kind of didn't give you as much as I wanted to. The, the fact of the matter is everybody's trying to make every grape act bigger, right? So it's like, you know, you, you can't make a penguin a polar bear, right? But that's what they're trying to do. And they're doing it in the chemistry labs. I don't know what they're doing. They don't even let me look at the wine making rooms anymore because I feel like there's cheating going on. I, mean, I feel like they're pouring different grapes in there. They're doing a lot, anything they need to do to sell wine, it's a business. And so that's kind of where it's at. Like people have just not wanted, people just want big fruit bombs and they've gone away from anything that offers any kind of terroir, truth from the land. So it kind of sucks. And I'm trying to push that hard. Yes? You can take, you can, let, let's sniff the next wine. Or sniffy sniff as I like to say. Who's, who's brave enough to admit that they started shitting on Merlot after Sideways and they were drinking it before? Good for you. See, that's awesome. Both wearing green. Big ups to the New York Jets. Just gotta get that in real quick. Yes. So, but it's uh, true, right? I mean, that's what it is. Speaking of uh, 2005 Bordeaux, um, right. so I, I personally actually like Bordeaux a lot. I sure. That's, that's what I not grew up drinking, but that's kind of how I got into wine. Uh, my dad was a big fan of Bordeaux. So I actually missed most of your episodes on Bordeaux. So it wasn't until a few weeks ago I've actually found out about the fact that uh, 2005 is supposed to be this revolutionary year. And I was fortunate enough a couple of weeks ago to try one of the 2005 at some wine tasting and I really liked it. Now my question is, is it too late to actually buy some of the good, uh, good 2005 Bordeaux? So let me tell you real quick what's going on with 2005 Bordeaux. Bordeaux in this country is sold on futures. You buy it two years before it comes out. That's just a really cool thing those guys figured out to trick everybody on. Brilliance. Anyway, I mean, it's just brilliance. Anyway, so I'm just so smart. Anyway. The prices have exploded. There's wines that we're selling right now for $400 a bottle that were $180 a bottle 12, 13 months ago. So you can imagine, this brings out all the characters, right? The futures market, like all the Wall Street guys. I mean, you can make a lot of money. Is it too late? Yes. It's too late, you lost. But not really, right? You lost in the fact that you're not gonna be able to really make a crazy killing on your return. Can you still spend $60, $50 and get outrageous, like classic, like I'm gonna put this away for my daughter's wedding wine? Yeah, $50? absolutely. And more importantly for everybody in this room, when Bordeaux is awesome and it has a great vintage, it kills it in 15 and under. Even with the crap ass Euro, there's still some really significant good buys between 12 and $18 in 2005 Bordeaux. And what's great about Bordeaux as a whole, we're generalizing is, they tend to be more balanced. They tend to. 
they blend a lot more and they're, they, they do tend to be a little bit more towards the terroir and so there's, it, it's just not over the top obnoxious like me, it's a little bit more calm. So Bordeaux is very classic and very food friendly. A lot of these wines that we're getting out of Australia and California right now are just so big, they overpower your entire meal. I mean, have people felt that? Have you had wines? I mean, you know, that's a big head shake move right there, right? But you love it. But that's awesome. And you should embrace that. But the one thing you should not do, and I don't want people to walk away from the big fruit bombs from Barossa or California that are massive and taste so good and being seduced by the fruit. I just want people to try other things. It's like, you know, how many people here have had Chateauneuf de Pop? Raise your hand. Solid. You were quick. You like Chateauneuf de Pop? <laughs> you were like, yes. Um, how about Chinon from the Loire Valley? And for, I mean, that's way, very good. How about Bourgoy from the Loire Valley? For, are you from the Loire Valley? In <laughs> there you go. Um, how about Bergerac? A wine from Bergerac. I mean, you know, you're going to start getting less and less and there's these amazing inexpensive, interesting wines. And what's going on in Portugal right now, let me talk about that for a quick second, I'm gonna give them a huge shout out, an absolute opportunity for you guys if you wanna drink good wine right now. Portugal, especially the Douro region, D-O-U-R-O, kills between five and 10. I still have not, I had a wine the other day, it was like six bones. I was like, all right, hold on. The Euro is $1.60. How, the glass is two dollars. I mean, how in the world? I'm like, are they like, are the workers paying them to like make this wine? I, I have not mathematically been able to backtrack into this wine, and it was real good. I'm talking, kicks yellowtail in its face, destroys Kendall Jackson. I mean, just way, way better than the stuff that you're buying at the supermarkets every day. So, a little homework, a little exploring can open up a lot of things. Plus, it'll give you an opportunity to really expand your palate, and you'll find what you like. I mean, I'm convinced that every single person here has not had their favorite grape varietal to date. Still. I mean, I had a wine recently from Lebanon that killed. I mean, just destroyed. It was expensive. Like, the guy's like, here, you should buy this for a store. It's amazing. The French winemaker, great terroir. I'm like, what is it? He's like, this Lebanese Syrah. I'm like, well, how much is it? Well, retail for 60 bucks. I'm like, (laughs) you know, I started laughing at him because that is a non-sellable product. But... um, I tasted it and it dominated and I bought it because I want to put it in people's hands. It's still a non-sellable product. But the fact of the matter is it's something that I want people to explore. And I'm not sure if there's like some residue from grenades or something in the vineyard that makes it so good. I don't know what's going on there. But the wine is like really got a different stylistic flavor profile. And it's amazing. It tastes like $200 Bordeaux. So, jump back there in the green. I was good, I was good at memory. Hello. Hello. Um, so my favorite wine right now is this is this red that's a, got a bunch of different grapes in it. Yep. And it's um, cloudy. Like, I don't know if that means it's unfiltered. And it's physically cloudy. Yeah. It's a red or a white? It's a red. Okay. And it's got Cabernet Franc in it and various other types. Do you know what it's called? Yeah, it's made by Thackeray. It's called Pleiades. Sean H. Thackeray. Yeah. Yeah. That and wine is it, domination. It's totally awesome. unfiltered. Yeah. That guy is a killer. That guy is... Uh, it, I think one of the first 10 wines I ever had was a Sean H. Thackeray. He makes a wine called Orion. Yeah, I have that too. Yeah, that is gotten expensive though. He's over, yeah, but, it's overpriced, but Pleiades is great. I mean, it's unfiltered. It's completely unfined, unfiltered, real throwback process. So uh, are there a lot of unfiltered wines and what's your opinion on them, I was gonna ask? Um, there are a lot of unfiltered wines. I mean, he's really raw. You know, he wants it to be like, you know, as true as possible. Have you spent a lot of time drinking wines from the south of France? You know, Roussillon, the Languedoc, Provence. You need to go there and need to go there now. Like, now. You should leave. Seriously. <laughs> I mean, like, that's where you need to roll because you'll find wines between 10 and $25 that are going to give you the same pleasure level as that uh, Pleiades. And, and the fact that you enjoy that wine, do you mainly drink New World California wines for the most part? The fact that you gravitate towards that wine really indicates that your DNA is in the place of really looking at some of these more Southern Rhone um, have you had a Chateauneuf de Pop? Yeah. And what did you think of that? I mean, again, you could have had a suck ass Chateauneuf de Pop. But, by yeah, yeah, understood. You need to definitely look at Languedoc and Provence, especially for everyday wine. Do you have everyday wine? Do you drink, and what do you drink for that usually? Maybe. Well, <laughs> you're a baller. What was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> I don't roll like that. 
So I think it's great what you're doing um, at the intersection of the consumer and the, the retailer. Sure. And kind of bringing them close, kind of uh, getting rid of that, um, the prestige, the chateau, the scripty font, all that hoity-toity stuff. But you're also telling a story and you're bringing people closer to that. What do you think wineries or winemakers could do to get people closer to it? Um, you know, you don't have to take, go behind the scenes sure. at French Laundry to enjoy right. that, but you, you want to engage with people on that level. Well, what do, I, what I, would you recommend wineries do? I would recommend do? giving a crap about their customers. You know, physically caring. Because right now, especially on, you know, in this state, what they want to do is they want to bring you on the weekend and charge you 10 bucks for a glass. That's what they want to do. And they want to figure out how to get into Walmart and Costco and how to put the right, what is the, wineries spend more time now spending on what's the right animal to put on the label that's going to seduce you guys to buy it than they do about the product they're putting out. And more importantly, because I don't even mind about the product they're putting out, because to be very honest with you, 98% of the market doesn't know anyway between a, a lot of the variables. They just don't care about their consumer. You know, I mean, have you looked at a winery website lately? <laughs> I mean, where is the good one? I mean, it's, it's very, very difficult. But there's more and more cool things going on. Um, and clearly, you know, as technology races ahead, you know, the wine industry will be five years behind, but you know, five years behind from today is actually decent. That's when some good stuff started happening. So I think people are starting to say, oh, maybe, you know, I, I cannot believe there is not a video blog right now about them working the harvest. There's a lot of nerds that want to see that stuff. I don't want to see people pick grapes. There's a lot of people that do, right? And so they, there's little things they can do. You know, if, if one of these wineries gets a quick phone, they might be able to do some damage. You know, so I mean, it's, it's, there's just a caring and an understanding of where the marketplace is. The explosion, explo I created a very non-scalable app on Facebook the day the platform came out. It was called Ask Gary. My theory was brilliance. <laughs> Ask me a wine question and I'll answer it. And so, but you know, very scalable. Anyway, it dominated. And, but what's funny about it is the questions blew my mind. You have to understand, 10 years ago, I was 21 and I wanted everybody who was 21 to be into wine. I'm gonna, you know, make it, let's go, come with me, right? And you know, I'd come to a party and I'd bring a bottle of wine, everybody'd be like, Dude, you're such a dork. Put that down to do a keg stand. You know, it was like there was no interest whatsoever. But now there is far more interest, even at the 22 to 28 year old. I mean, there was a kid from the University of Alabama who asked me a question about Bondol. That's unheard of. That's unheard of. That's unheard of now. You know, but, but technology's changed the game. I mean, when I wanted to learn about wine when I was 17, 18, I actually had to go to the library and get like Hugh Johnson's wine books. God forbid I had the internet. Pfft. I would have been a wine freaking master. <laughs> Anybody else? Uh, just a comment about the, uh, the way wineries treat you when you walk in. Sure. Um, I would make a recommendation to anybody here to look local. The Santa Cruz Mountains, most of them don't charge for their tastings, and they make their money through their tasting rooms. They don't make enough wine to sell them through Walmart and whatnot, so they got to treat you like a person when you walk in the door. So. Sure, I mean, and it's give and take, right? I mean, or, or, or hit and miss. I mean... You can't, you know, Santa Cruz, they're gonna have some jerk offs too and have some great people, right? I mean, I've, I've been to Colo Chance. It's hit and miss, right? I mean, what, what really bothers me about California, to be honest with you, is it's very hometown. It's very hometown. And so is Washington. I'm going to Washington tomorrow to do Taste of Washington. I'm like the big favorite there because I've been preaching that Walla Walla Washington is better than Napa Valley. And then on Tuesday, I gotta speak at Napa Valley, which is gonna be pretty tough at Copia, the Mondavi thing, they're gonna boo me off stage. But the fact of the matter is, is that everybody's too hometown on the West Coast. That's the greatness that the New York consumer has because they get the whole flavor. They really do. I mean, California consumers are, we, we're, we're gonna do $11 million in sales in California this year. And a, a lot of it's California wine that we ship back. And I laugh at that, but what's exciting is a lot of people are buying wines that are, um, from Europe. I mean, there's some really great stores in California, whether it's, you know, K&L or, you know, or no, Premier Crew or Woodland Hills. I mean, there's a lot of good people doing a lot of good things, but the selection and the opportunity and the thought process of a lot of people here, generalizing, of course, is that there's a lot of consumption of local wines here, which is great. 
I'm down for support of the U.S. I'm huge on USA, USA. But the fact of the matter is, is that you've got to try different things because there's so much awesome stuff going on. South Africa, who's drinking South African wine at all? Who's loving South African wine? Right? I mean, Pinotage. Anybody like Pinotage? I mean, if you like bacon, bananas, and copper pennies, that's yours. I mean, that's all you. And so that's a process that I really am trying to get people to engage into trying different things because, and really trusting themselves, right? Not being embarrassed, like, if you want to rock out white Zinfandel, God bless you. Please. Yellowtail, Two Buck Chuck. I did an episode on Two Buck Chuck. Everybody asked me to do that. And, you know, everybody expected me to do, I don't know, whatever, uh, uh-oh. DMAT, do something, password? Is it Google? That would have been awesome. How about this wine? How many people, uh, let's do this. Let's sni- you finished it already. I'm, that's good work. So did you. Ladies are doing well already. You did as well, good. All right. Um, how many people liked this wine? Raise your hand. How many people hated this wine? Tell me why you hated it, sir. Don't forget, your palate is right. Kind of tasted metallic to me. Metallic. You ate more metal than I did. <laughs> no. Well, I, I, I get anise as well. I mean, what, it has very bitter back end tannins, and your mouth is much drier than it started. So this is a dry wine. I do get a little, a little metal, a little aluminum bat, right? Yeah. A little, a little bit. Um, so this is not crazy fruit. This is kind of balanced for a Merlot. It's got a very heavy, dark black chocolate finish on the end. Are you guys picking that up at all? Do you get the little cocoa chocolate kind of thing going on? The nose. The nose a little bit? Let me just show you this. I think you might get a kick out of this. Right, when I hit home here, it doesn't work. <laughs> so, great. How do I get this to slide over? Slide. Top bar. Top bar, thanks. Thank you. You notice I'm very big on friend you me up. So this episode. So like two buck chuck, right? How many people here have had two buck chuck? Awesome. How many people were obsessed with Two Buck Chuck for a few minutes? Nice. So I'm really, I'm really big on showing this show because mainly because of my hair. Mainly because of my hair. But um, hello everybody and welcome to Wine Library TV. I am your host Gary Vayner Chuck, and this is Wine Library TV. God, I'm so Huge I'm episode. Days. Michael Goldberg challenged me. To the Charles so this guy said, Shaw You're gonna challenge, do two Chuck. I challenge and here you, you see and the wall of and Shaw. Can't open it I will before. be tasting six so I promise of the like Charles Shaw right. wine. Trader it. Joe's exclusive so label. Uh, Michael I was told good people to that if they drank the Beaujolais, they him could him die. On the show, and many of the like other it was the worst wine I think I've ever had. The biggest way, way low. I get every single day. If I remember properly, two buck Chuck. I kind of like the Sauvignon Blanc four buck and the Chuck, Chirac. depending on what state you live on, especially the Sauvignon Blanc in, in the United comparison States of America. So all the we're other going California to tackle this Blanc. massive wine so, issue, and because I get so many questions a day, that just shows here, the enormous that, right? effort that Fred Franzia from the Bronco Wine Company the fact the matter is and the Trader too Joe's many people, people have done that are worried about what other people think. To them for at this point, when I did this show, I was already in the front page of the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, and Time Magazine. Things were going really well for me, and. A lot of people would have been scared to come out and say, I like Two Buck Chuck, when you've got, at that point, I don't know, 25,000 people listening to you and you're next Robert Parker, blah, 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 blah. But for me, that wraps up my message more than anything, which is that you just have to like what you like. And I honestly think that if you make a commitment to just go into the store and try a varietal you've never had before. How many people here have had Greco de Tufo? Yes, <laughs> zero. All right, let's write that down or email yourself. I know you're techie. You know, Greco de Tufo, how many people here have had Pinot Grigio? <laughs> how many people like Pinot Grigio? Yeah, it's good. It's a good summertime drink. Pinot Grigio sucks. 
globally compared to Greco de Tufo, globally, of course. I mean, I look at a product like Santa Margarita, that is the biggest waste of 20 bones on earth. Better, you're better off going seeing the worst movie on earth and buying popcorn than drinking a bottle of Santa Margarita. There you go, getting rowdy already? <laughs> um, yes? I, oh. um, you actually sound like Jim Cramer a little bit on the video. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that's what, that's what my agents keep telling everybody. <laughs> <laughs> He's right. Um, so whenever I go to, to, to a restaurant, and um, since I'm French and I go there with my friends, and they all look at me and say, like, oh, why don't you pick the wine? Like, I already know Reverse better. Reverse stereotype, right? Yes. Right? They're prejudiced against you. So, um, you know, frankly, most of the time, I really have no idea of right. what I do. But you put so, up a good facade, right? Of course, yeah. Of course. Yeah. All right, so, good, good work. So I'm, I'm screwed with everybody here, but at least, <laughs> could you tell me, like, could you give me some tips on how to get really the good, the best wine on a menu? Because it's not necessarily the most expensive one. Yep. It's not necessarily the cheapest one either. Sure. I mean, price has no impact whatsoever. I mean, I went to uh, a Crew, which is a big time restaurant in New York City. Has anybody be ever been there? Awesome, right? You liked it? I mean, crazy wine list. Did you have a good time there? It's nice, right? How about Veritas? Has anybody been to Veritas in New York? You been there? Really? I mean, these are crazy wine lists. And I ordered a $630 bottle of Red Burgundy from 1990, which is the killer vintage. Decanted for two hours, did all the right things. The wine was so boring, it was devastating, for lack of a better word. There is no perfect science, right? You know, like I said before, really, if, if, if I had my way, when they gave you that list and you'd look at it and you'd say, Condru, I've never had Condru. You probably have because you're French, right? And you've drank some wines from the Rhone Valley. But, you know, whatever it is, if I can get to a place where you look at a wine list and say, Petit Verdot, 100% Petit Verdot, I've never had 100% Petit Verdot. I want to order that and you can remember what you like, then I basically accomplished my global mission. That, that to me is, that's the place you need to be because if everybody does that and cares enough about wine that they're kind of into it and remember what they like and didn't like, well then in six months to a year you're gonna have everything you need to go everywhere and make decisions. I mean there's nothing I can do besides this secret software I'm working on with this kid where you take the picture with your iPhone and it gets emailed and then based on your friends' selections and your selections, it aggregates and your favorite wine and the wines you've liked in the past will email you back within three minutes. If I can pull that off, then I'll have something. But other than that, um, it's really best off that you just try a different wine every time. So let's talk about ask. God, you saved me, thank you. So here's, a, here's my fundamental global rule about a restaurant wine list. You come in, you sit down, whether it's a waiter or a sommelier comes over and you say, I, I, I need some help. You know, they, usually they say, would you like some help? You go, yes. If, if uh, what do you, you ask them what do you think? It's very important we, we, we say it that way. If the psalm, he or she, recommends you something, you never listen to that person for the rest of your life. Because fundamentally they have no idea what you like. And that goes true for a wine store as well. I actually fired an employee not too long ago because he did not listen to the card. I mean, this is my cardinal rule. You can't have somebody come in and say, hey, you know, I need some help. What would you like? I'm looking for some six red bottles of red wine. You can't go and recommend something because you have no feel for the palate of the person in front of you. You have to ask them, what have you liked in the past? I built my business on people coming to me and saying, I like Silver Oak, I like Camus, I like Chateau Montalena, and I would give them things similar but different. And that's what should happen. If you ask somebody and they come over and they say, you know, what do you think? And they say, well, you should try this, it's a great Merlot, we just got it in, they're out. Order something else, and that's, but if they ask you what do you like, now you're going in the right place. So asking is great, especially if they ask you back. You know, what do you like? I mean, how many people here like red Zinfandel? Not the, not the pink stuff. I mean, that's a spicy, racy wine. Do the same people that like white Zinfandel, do you guys like Sangiovese, like Super Tuscans? You know, I mean, there's parallels. Some will fall off, but it's a progression to the next step, right? Not the next step, better or worse, just a similar labor profile, a little different. How many people here who raise, how many people like red Zinfandel and have had red Zinfandel? Raise your hand real quick. How many of you have had Primotivo from Italy? Good number. Clear. Somebody did something right. It's good. Do you guys, does anybody have a preference? How many people like the Primitivo a whole lot? 
really. Well, it's the same grape varietal, but it's, to- but it's not a trick question at all because Primitivo's terroir, where it's produced from, is so fundamentally different than Napa or Paso Robles or wherever the sins that we sell are. It's, such a, it's a totally different animal. It can be, except when a lot of producers in Italy now go into the room and try to make it taste like the California stuff that gets 93 points because Turley Zin is hot, you know? So, all right, one more time. How many people hated the last wine? I'm just trying to get a feel for myself. This is important data. You hated it, huh? Why? Dusty. It is dusty. That's, that's a, so I like the cellar dust aspect of this wine, but that's a great call. I understand. You can stick your tongue out, but I'm still going to like it. Um, but yeah, it does have a dusty cellar. That's a great call. That, what I call attic, you know, like kind of like, I used to like to garage sale a lot and be like, can you go in your attic? That's where the good stuff was. So very, you know, dusty and cobweb. Cool. All right, let's try the next wine. Third wine, is it out here? Yep, lateral, Catherine Kennedy. Anybody have any other wine questions or any other? Anybody want to talk Jets football? No? Damn. We have a great draft pick. So you mentioned your your uh, epiphany came when you were driving, you know, on the road one Sunday, right? And you said you were just. Oh, it wasn't miserable. Sunday. It was November fourteenth, uh, okay. two thousand five. So why were you so miserable before, and are you still miserable, or are you much? You know what's so funny? I wasn't miserable at all, right? I I repositioned my family on November thirteenth. I thought I was the happiest boy on earth. It just hit me. It was just like, you know, this is not what I want to do anymore. I want to do something else. And basically, I walked in and told one of my stock guys, go to. Circuit City and buy a camera. It's like, you know, it's just, you know, there's a lot of things I believe in in life and one is if you do what you love and you don't lie to yourself, you'll always win regardless of what you're doing. I just don't lie to myself and that day I was driving to work, I'm like, I'm 30 years old now. Do I like where I'm at? Am I closer to buying the New York Jets? No, all right, I don't want to do this anymore. There's too much cool stuff going on. A million people just watched Andy Samberg who came from the internet do a skit on SNL. Wine has no hero or somebody that's doing something interesting. And so I just, you know, I'm, I was happy then. I was, I was only not happy for about 28 minutes. You know what I mean? It was just that drive that I just knew that I had to do something different. And I did. Yeah, so I, I have more of a question about the, you, the website that you've built and, and um, you know, the social media part of your business. So. Are you, do you have an engineering background and, you know, how did, how did you... Uh... I built my empire in control C, control V. <laughs> this is what I always say. Nice. So I did something very smart, luckily. Uh, when, in 2000, when things were tough, in 2001, especially in New York, after 9-11, I hired two devs, pretty cheap. And one of them, Eric Kastner, he wrote Spell with Flickr. That was his first big internet fame. Um, behind my back during store hours, God damn it. I actually pay him to read RSS feeds at this point. He's, very, he's like, he can't stay focused. That's why every product we launch is like nine months late. I, I hired a couple devs and, uh, and uh, I, you know, we all sat in a very, I mean, we had a, I had a small family business. I mean, right, you saw that big picture that you guys just saw of the store now, but before it was 4,000 square feet and our entire office which we were doing like $20 million in internet sales, was like this big and like nine of us sat there. And he sat right next to me. And on his first day in 2002, oh, this is awesome. First time there's some really good, this is gonna be good. I'm happy to tell this story. Um, the first day he started was like January 2002. He looked over at me and goes, why are you using Yahoo? Go to Google. And this is true, <laughs> this is true, it gets better. I go to Google and I go, this is stupid shit. It's such a blank page, this is not gonna do shit. You know, I mean, so, but, he, you know, he's like, you need to read Jason Kotke. I'm like, what? You know, we read Waxy, what? You know, here's Flickr. And so we had this great culture and I was so zoned in on selling stuff, which is so anti what this culture was, but every day I'm sitting there and I'm learning and I'm watching and I'm learning, right? And so, uh, you know, YouTube was huge because we caught YouTube crazy, crazy early and watching it because the day American Idol debuted in America, I registered becomingfamous.com during the show. I was like, this, is hu- this show's gonna be huge, which I was right, but I'm gonna make a website that's gonna replicate it. But I had very evil intentions. Like, you were gonna sign up and I was gonna own like 15% of your life, even if you were like a third grader who sang, right? 
But, you know, this was my intention. And so when YouTube came out, we caught it real early and I was like, wow, this is kind of what, you know, this hurts when I think about it. But, you know, back then bandwidths were insane. And so anyway, um, we, I watched YouTube really, care, really carefully and my grammar is obnoxiously horrible. So I missed the whole blogging thing. Right, and I watched that go and I was like, this sucks. You know, just watching it. And so as soon as video felt, and I wasn't big on the, you know, I didn't get on the podcasting, you know, Odeo and all that, you know, kind of let, I let Ev have his mistake. And then, you know, but when video was right, I, I jumped in pretty hard. So the, the thing that, that, you know, you have to understand what is all, what's going on now, right? What's really happening now is that people are interacting and socializing, right, social media. I, my fundamental DNA is I love people. Like, if I can hang out with people all the time, that's, I just like people a lot. Like, bad people too, right? Like, I feel like they're good. I feel like you can fix them. So, this is kind of, this whole movement is kind of built for me, and I'm also very much into Hustle 2.0, which is, I answer every email. Everyone. And that's like, you know, big time. And, and keeps me in tune with the fan base and my friends, and so, um, no, I have no skills whatsoever, you know? I wanted to learn how to code in Ruby on Rails. I had this like epiphany one day, morning the other day. It wasn't like a, the same kind of epiphany. By the time I got into the store, I was out. So, but I was hot on it for like 18 minutes. Uh, I have a question about uh, storing wine. Like yep. Most places will tell you to store it in a cool, dry place like a cellar. Yep. Unfortunately, a lot of us don't have cellars. Correct. Uh, what's the next best thing? Especially if you're for, not like, worried, for if you're not storage. worried for long-term storage, well, if you're spending money. It's like, are you gonna buy an antique car and leave it outside? So if you're gonna spend dough, if you're gonna spend some bones on a wine collection, you better make sure it doesn't go bad. The fact of the matter is though, if you're gonna consume the wine within even the first two years, I'm almost comfortable in saying, this is kinda outlandish, but you know, kitchen counter is probably gonna be fine. Unless the sun's hitting it, if you're consuming it in the first year or two, you don't need that little fridge that you made that big investment on that you think you needed. That's long term stuff, peeps. That's long term, that's like five, seven, nine years. So I have another question. Uh, you're sort of upset with the homogeneity of the wine, especially inf influenced by Parker and Wine Spectator. But people, when they go to the stores, they choose what to buy. And as an owner, you see what people buy. And I'm guessing that a lot of people like it. Like the scores? Well, like the uh, fruit bombs. They like, you Hell know. yeah. So but at some no, level, you know, if their palate is right. God bless. I have no problem. You have to understand, though, in 1998, I was the kid that was standing for fruit bombs when nobody was drinking them. So I just didn't capture it on video. You know, if Wine Library TV, if this movement started, we'd watch video and I, I looked really cute in 1998. It would've been awesome. And so I was yelling at people saying, you know what, Bordeaux is not the best wines in the world. Why can't Australia and Spain be good? I think Barossa Valley is gonna be huge. So, you know, at some level, I think there's a little bit of that in Wine Library TV too that I like that I'm documenting a lot of things. Like, there's a great video I did about 2005 Bordeaux. When 2005 Bordeaux really first hit the scene, Joel, you, you're a wine guy, you know this, a lot of people contemplated the prices were too high, it was a stupid investment, the wines came out very expensive, they raised the crap out of them. And everybody's like, don't buy, it'll get better. The Euro was 125, and everybody's like, it's gonna come down, right? That didn't work out. Um, and I went on Wine Library TV multiple times in a short period of time, yelling and screaming at everybody who watched to buy 2005 Bordeaux because I went to France, I tasted the wines and I knew what they were. And so that's kind of cool to like look back and be like, see, see, you know, so that's kind of fun, the documentation of it. So, but in 1998, I was screaming at people who had no interest in drinking anything but California and French wine and telling them, you have to drink these Australian wines. They're so lo loaded with candy and spree and like over the top fruit. People are gonna love this stuff and they did. The problem is, you know, I'm always trying to just get a, a little bit closer to the middle, that's all. I have no problem. Just two days ago, I did a show on how I even am getting back into the fruit a little bit more and did an Australian show and one wine was really good, one wine was terrible. But. So you were too successful in 1998. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, there's a lot of things when I look back at that, it was like, I mean, I didn't drive the market, Parker did. You know, I bought all these Australian wines. My dad wanted me to like, punched me in the face, really. He was like, what are you doing? I was buying $50 Barossa Shirazes that nobody's ever heard of with outlandish names like Wild Duck Muck, like these crazy <laughs> sick names. And, but I was in a store, I worked every hour. So I knew I would hand sell them. 
And then sure enough, Parker came out and gave like everything, 98, 99, 97 points, which was unheard of, higher than California. And that was really my first big, you know, that's when all the guys on Wall Street were like, oh, we're gonna listen to him. He was right, he made us a lot of money. <laughs> you know, because the wines went up a lot and what have you. Anybody have any other wine questions? Or tech questions? Or? And we got, and I want to break down this last wine because that's really. Oh, okay. Yeah, uh, yeah, I'll do that quickly. I'll do it quickly though. Is so this, this, the last? this isn't good enough to be the last question. I was just wondering. Like, so both these reds are good, especially this last one. But, right. Um, it's got a lot of flavor, but almost no smell. And maybe that's a function of the glass being too small. But am I nose impaired or? So let's get into the wine because you went into something really great, and we can talk about young wine. I mean, I get I get some things on the bouquet. I mean, I definitely get wood chips. You know, like like landscaper wood chips. Like big time. I get a little, uh, uh, little oak monster. Be careful of the oak monster. He will get you. Big time. Um, uh, but you're right, it's, it's, it's aromatically challenged, which is always a problem for me because I'm big on the nose of the wine. The fruit is really pure and clean, it's good. So, you know, I just did something. While we're here, we got a couple seconds. Take the, your next sip, really mouthwash your palate. I want you to, or before you do that, I know I got you in midstream. Drink it the way you drank it before or if you just drank it, try to at least capture that in your mind. Now mouthwash it. I guarantee you'll be shocked by the difference of flavor profile you're gonna taste. Get real loud. Don't be scared front row. I like how everybody's looking. Does anybody see a significance? I mean, it's, it's, it's substantial. I mean, you've seen the charts in health class, right? There's a lot of, you, you really want to get it as many parts into your palate. So to answer your question, it's based on youth. Do you taste what you're tasting now, which is kind of bitter and very dry in your mouth? That's the tannins. That's what's blocking the bouquet. Over time, if you age this, in three or four years, if we'd open this up, the secondary flavors on the nose and the flavor profile of this wine really heavy on plum, the strawberry fruit will start coming through because if you really get in there you can kind of get that strawberry flavor underneath if you, depending on how strong your sense of smell is. But you know, yeah mine too. But you know, um, over time, three, four, five years of aging, that's when things really open up, the wine will soften and kind of level out. I am sick on decanting. If you do any, if you want to watch any episode of Wine Library TV after this, you're like, oh that guy was kind of weird, let me watch one show. On the top, just put in the number sign, 18. It was the 18th show I did. First result for decanting on Google. Um, and watch it, that decanting episode. Decanting wine, too many people think that decanting wine is only for a $100 bottle of wine. Decanting wine that is like seven to $10 is magical. <laughs> <laughs> it's a huge factor, guys. I'm serious, you'll be so pumped. Buying a $20 decanter is like one of the best things you can do. I mean, if you don't want to do that, use a vase, something. Just <laughs> seriously. It is a big time play that will make you enjoy your wine investment so much more. So, uh, decanting, I'm very big on, see, but I, I nerded up a little bit. Maybe, I'm big on an hour as a global rule, right? Like, I have this global rule of an but for me, when I decant, my number one thing, especially if you're really kind of interested in wine, I mean, you came here, so you might be somewhat, right? I mean, taste it along the way. Pop a bottle, drink it while you're cooking or getting ready, okay, got that, try to, go back 25 minutes later, go back an hour later, go back an hour and a half later, like, the development will teach you so much, especially if you do it like four or five times, you're gonna start getting patterns. The fundamental thing to really break this down and get to a great place though is to try different grape varietals. I'm telling you that is the secret, the biggest secret because like Greco de Tufo, oh, a zero in this class, a big goose egg, no hitter and it's, and it's really solid stuff and dollar for dollar and quality base, it destroys Pinot Grigio. It's like comparing Google to Dogpile. <laughs> See, see, I resonated there. So, you know, seriously, you have to try Greco de Tufo if you like Pinot Grigio. Cool. Go, go ahead, I'll stay here all question. day. What happened to the um, dominating the master sommelier ambitions? 
you know, my, my, my dad was very smart at understanding that I had some skills and the first year I ran the business we went from three million to 10 million and that changed the culture of our family life and that kind of kept me busy. <laughs> like, so, you know, and at the same token, you know, I was a lemonade stand kid and a baseball card kid. I mean, I did definitely want to have a great palate and I have obnoxious respect for the wine. I mean, the biggest problem, honestly, the marketing guys and the people that get mad at me for panning a wine don't bother me at all. I mean, really, I mean, it, it bothers me, but whatever. I mean, what am I gonna, what can I possibly do without doing the right thing? I do feel bad for the farmers and the people that really, I mean, people put their heart and soul into this product. This is a farming product, it's tough. And to sit there on a, on a, on a platform where there's close to 100,000 people watching you and, and listening to you, which is why, if you watch Wine Library TV, you know once a week I'm saying, don't listen to a single word I say. Don't, please don't buy this even though I love it. You know, I want people to embrace themselves. I feel bad for the farmers, uh, but the ambitions of being, I, I, my palate is extremely strong. I hang out with master sommeliers, not masters of wine, a couple though, and I can hang. Can I, can I beat them on the written test? Probably not, but when it comes to blind tasting, that's where I kind of, you know, I'm in the trenches. I made my, I made my name kind of there. I feel very comfortable if somebody wants. I think that's why the wine industry has been shockingly quiet at yelling back at me publicly because I'll be like, let's go on Ustream right now, live, blind tasting, let's see who's got the chops. And I do and a lot of them don't and they know it because they knew who I was before Wine Library TV. So I still want to challenge somebody on Ustream. Anyone want to step up? It or I'll keep. I'll, I'll, I'll keep asking. Keep asking. So how? how you should go to ask Gary on the how, application. How, how reliable is your palate, sort of, you know, over time? I, I sometimes find that I love wine, and then two months later, it just is terrible. Sure, I, I think your palate changes all the time. Is there a food that you used to love that you hate now? Maybe. That's the answer. I mean, I've done a really crazy thing with tomatoes. I went from loving to hating to loving. Sea urchins, real crazy, was super down on sea urchin. Now it's the only thing I order. So I think your palate changes, right? I mean, think about when you're little, you like like three things. You like eat chicken wings, right? Or like McDonald's and you're like, I'm not eating, you know, so your palate constantly evolves. Especially in this era now where, you know, you guys are lucky you have San Fran, so many awesome restaurants and like, even like chill, like medium tiers. I mean, it's cool, it's awesome. So, you know, I think wine's the same way. I think, you know, I mean, in 1998, all I drank was Barossa Valley Shiraz for like a year and a half. Now I make fun of it every single day. But I mean, it's just, it's just where I'm at. So I think people change, I think your palate changes, and I think things change, so. Yes? So we're running out of time. Uh, mm -hmm. The cameramen have to be elsewhere. But if you guys want to stick around and ask more questions to Gary, he's going to be right over there by the extra wine. And um, I am. Yeah, we just, thanks again for coming. Awesome, thank you so much, guys. This is awesome, thank you. <laughs>